yeah, I agree. Put on the mic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I don't think I don't think his perspective overlaps strongly with mine, but I, I would have to mull what he's doing right now more. Um, it, it something like that, which is a cosmological selection mechanism, would be wonderful. That it's like inflation. Inflation is a great theory. You can write the equations, and everybody can learn it. There are other variants of ideas that are to replace inflation. They sound good and plausible, but, but when you try to write it out, you, you run into trouble. So, and then not everybody can agree on it except the original authors. So um, that's where Judice's work is right now. But maybe we'll understand it better. Yeah. But his we are often not very compatible in philosophy. Yeah. I mean, we're very good friends, but, but we're not. Yeah. I mean, it's important to have multiple perspectives. Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody should be trying. So I'm very happy that he gives it a shot. Yeah. All right. Let's start again. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, we're pausing on the supersymmetry breaking part because I now wanted to move the West Zemino model closer to reality um, by uh, by introducing the famous minimal supersymmetric standard model. Okay. And um, again, I'm deferring gauge sector part for a, for a little bit for a bit. But first of all, there are these chiral superfields that we have been talking about up till now. And what we're going to do is we're going to have several species of them. Basically, here they are. Um, netly. Uh, and um, where these are the obvious things. For example, this is the chiral superfield which describes left-handed quarks and left-handed and, the, and their superpartners, OK? And it's obvious, right? And, and this curly H is the thing that has the Higgs field and the Higgs Zeno, about which more should be said in a second, OK? So that's it. And, and, and if we don't have gauge interactions, then we're sort of in a kind of multi-chiral field Wessimino model that we have to construct at the renormalizable level. So let's just get on with it, OK? So I'm going to do it subject to a few simplifying symmetries, which also have a physical impact, as you'll see. But think of it, for lack of time, as just saying, look, here's a, I, I, what, do I, what do I need to tell you? First of all, you'd say, well, what is the theory? Well, I have to tell you a Kähler potential. And that one's easy. It's just the canonical Kähler potential, um, which now we know is just this, where i is just all these things here, right? Um, so that's easy, got that one. Um, the question is what to do about uh, the superpotential. And at the renormalizable level, it's just like the West Amino model, cubic, quadratic, that's it. Um, but with the, with, the, with the knowledge that we are going to be adding gauge invariants to this whole story, we know the gauge quantum numbers of all of these particles, and hence their superpartners. So you know the gauge quantum numbers of all of these chiral superfields. And so how can we, we, we better write something that's gauge invariant in that superpotential. Um, so the symmetries, the symmetries that are constraining us are going to be uh, standard model gauge invariants. But, so that's an obvious one. But I wanted to add uh, a couple more that make it simpler. One second. Um, and uh, 
then the other one I'm going to do is, is, is a subtle one. Again, this one is mandatory. <laughs> These other ones are a choice, and you can study not having them. But I want to do something concrete today, so I'm imposing it. And R parity is a easy thing to describe. It's just weird when you think about it. But you can check in detail that we can apply it. And the easiest way to do it is to draw the mass spectrum of what we're going to be after, which is the standard model states somewhere there. And then there are the super partners out of current LHC reach or very schematically like this. And so here are the super partners. And R parity is a Z2 symmetry, which does not commute with supersymmetry, which means that different partners in the same multiplet can have different quantum numbers under R symmetry. But it's an incredibly simple assignment. It's that all the superpartners of the standard model are odd. So this is a parity, R parity. So it's just the quantum number is plus or minus. And everything in the standard model is even. Okay, And of course, that means that the squark and a quark have different assignments. So it's not like your standard quantum numbers. Like, for example, the gauge quantum numbers of squark and quark in this multiplet are the same. But this discrete symmetry is different. It's, it's looking through. It's looking inside the supermultiplet and assigning things in a different way. So that's a quick way to say it. And then we're going to write everything that when we check is consistent with that R parity, meaning the Lagrangian is even. The action is even under R parity. Okay? So I'm going, to, I'm going to do that. You guys can check me that I've written everything possible, consistent with gauge invariance in that superpotential and R parity. And then the last thing that I want to impose as a symmetry is called um, Peche Quinn symmetry. Um, who are the famous discoverers of the central part of the axion mechanism for solving the strong CP problem. Um, and this symmetry, I'm not telling you about the axion connection, but historically there's a connection to some of the models of axions. But the symmetry is, in, is, is something that I'm, I'll, I'll tell you in a second, because right now you're not in a position to know how it acts, OK? So I'm going to apply all these symmetries, and then we'll see where we get to. And there's a question. Um, is the only difference between this and the West Amina model that we have um, more fields? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, we're going to gauge these fields. But right now, it's exactly what you said. OK. So then let me write what is consistent with uh, these first two. And then we'll get to the subtlety of the peche quinn symmetry in a second. OK? So in the first two, uh, you're going to get trilinear terms, which look like gauge invariant combinations. Uh, let, me, let me start with this. Uh, like D conjugate H, where H has the quantum numbers of the Higgs in the standard model, uh, Q. OK? And, and this, if you remember, how we got various terms in components from the supersymmetric thing in, when we wrote everything out in detail in the West Amino model. This will contain things like the, down, the right-handed down quark, the Higgs doublet uh, scalar. This is a fermion. This is a scalar of the standard model. And uh, the doublet. Okay, So these things are Yukawa couplings. So this thing will eventually lead to Yukawa couplings plus various supersymmetric partners of this Yukawa coupling. So the coupling should be given a name. It shouldn't be called lambda. It should be called y for Yukawa. Okay? And of course, all of these things have three generations. So really, these are matrices. And they're just the Yukawa matrices. And we should call this y down, the Yukawa matrix for the y down. Um, but, but, but now, let's try to write the analog for y up. And here is the subtlety. So if you remember your Yukawa couplings, if you remember your Yukawa couplings in the standard model, you'll remember that 
when the Higgs couples to the down type guys, it's sort of the Higgs field that sits here. But when it couples to the up type guys, it's not the Higgs, it's this sort of conjugate of the Higgs. Okay? It's like Higgs dagger with the up and down, the isospin switched, okay, if you remember. But, in, but I don't care about the switching. I, I care about the fact that it's H dagger, okay? Because this is the superpotential. You can't write H dagger, H bar. H bar is something that sits in the anti so this, you know, the anti superpotential, the anti chiral superpotential. It's the, it, so if I'm writing this, this part, there is no candidate field, there's no chiral field, chiral superfield that I can put here subject to the gauge invariance because I'm not allowed to bar it in a superpotential. So what that really means is I need another Higgs, which has, a, I need another chiral multiplet which has the conjugate quantum numbers to, let's say the standard model Higgs, okay? So therefore, this is necessarily, the MSSM is necessarily a two Higgs doublet model where there are two species of Higgses called H up and H down, okay? And there are two Higgs doublet scalars and they're, and they're, and they're Higgsinos, okay? So that now is, is that, and then I think you can sort of see where the rest is going, which is that you would have the leptons having um, things like that. Um, so these are all allowed by R parity. And there's only one more thing that's allowed by R parity. And that is something which is, now that we have these two guys, which have conjugate quantum numbers, you can multiply the two together. And, and, and sum over their, contract their isospins. Okay, so that's allowed. And this quadratic term, the only mass term that's allowed, has a coefficient which is called mu. I'm putting quotes on it because it's not the renormalization group scale. It's not some other thing you might call mu. It's this famous or infamous supersymmetric term mu. Okay? Now, I am going to get, it turns out it's a nuisance. It's got a famous problem named after it called the mu problem. But for lack of time, I don't want to stake this lecture on that. I'm going to solve that problem, but with, perhaps without you even knowing it. Okay, so, so the quick thing is I'm going to get rid of this by imposing one more symmetry, and that is that this Peche Quinn symmetry where H up goes to E to the I some phase H up, and H down does the same thing. Oh, gosh, um, here, H up and H down, okay? They're rephased the same way, not in opposite ways, the same ways, and therefore, if I want that symmetry, I can't write this term down, yeah? Um, I don't understand why that term is a problem. Right, you don't. Okay. <laughs> um, good, so, um, so, so then the last part of building the MSSM is, of course, to add the gauge structure. Now, this is a very interesting exercise. It again comes from superfields, but not chiral superfields. It comes from the full superfields that we started with, okay, that. But it's, it, it, it's often called a real superfield in that it's not the chiral superfield, which is only a function of y and theta. It's the full deal, but it's one which equals its conjugate. And these real superfields are often called V, not for potential. The field is called V. Um, that's just the name. You can think of it as a vector superfield if you want, V for vector. Uh, technically, it's just a real superfield, okay? So it's back to this. Um, and who does it contain when you've done all the gauge structure and gauge fixing this? That? Well, it contains who we wanted it to contain, the gauge field and its Gageino superpartner, as we anticipated earlier on. But it also contains a scalar field, which however turns out to be purely auxiliary, just like the F field for chiral superfields. So, so these are the things that will really turn out to be the propagating degrees of freedom, which is great. And when you integrate this out, it'll just give you some potential. Okay. So let me just describe, so I'm not going to go through that thing, I've given you the blow-by-blow blow microscopic derivation of the sort of West Zumino models and their generalizations. 
to show you that it's really not that hard. And you can read this. I've given you the references to do that. I have updated the references that I've uploaded so far. Uh, one second. And, um, but I want to say, for this part, so what does it add? You know all about that. And that's the gory part with many moving parts. But what difference does this make? If we write everything out in components, let me just do that. I'll come to the question. Let me just do that because it's so easy to write out, if you just trust me, that the L of all the gauge stuff um, is equal to, OK? Well, first of all, it will affect all of the So secretly, when you unpack this, you get a lot of derivatives, right? There don't seem to be any derivatives at this level, but we know how they come about. So one thing that's obvious is that it better do this. As far as the matter fields are concerned, all the phi's, it better do this, and it does. Okay, so there's some way in which derivatives of matter fields turn into covariant derivatives of matter fields. Then the other thing that it better do, and it does, is it better give you the usual g mu nu squared, and it better give some canonical looking gauged gauginos in the adjoint representation. Um, but there are only two things that you wouldn't have guessed. But on further reflection, maybe at least one of them you would have guessed, which is there's sort of a, a gaugino. So this is the gauge coupling. The gaugino can couple, can, has Yukawa couplings with matter. And they look like this. It was sort of, if you, on reflection, maybe easy to guess. But Plus Hermitian contrail. Okay. And, 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 and you can see what's going on. Phi and psi are sitting inside a chiral multiplet phi of species i. Okay, the, those guys there. And this lambda has a Yukawa coupling. You see there's a fermion fermion scalar. So you have this kind of Yukawa coupling, and because of course there are several components of phi, several species of phi, this TA is the usual matrix that represents the gauge group, the eighth, the eighth generator of the gauge group, in the representation of the ith matter species. Okay? It's very much like the gauge coupling. The gauge coupling would say have phi and phi, or psi bar and psi, and the gauge field would couple in the same representation. Okay, so that's maybe not so surprising. And then the last thing that you just couldn't have guessed unless you worked it out in detail, is what is the fate of this thing? That it's an auxiliary field, you integrate it out, and all it does is give you a new potential, which I can write here. I better lift this. This is a sum over i again of uh, phi bar. So this is only for scalars. OK? Um, and so the last thing I'll say before I get to that question is that this potential is often called the D-term potential. OK, that's the D-term potential. And therefore, the total potential, at least at tree level, if you recall, there was already potential that comes out from integrating out the auxiliary fields F. And now there's a potential that comes from integrating out the D-terms D. And that's it. Okay, that, that is the complete specification of the supersymmetric standard model. Uh, there was a question. Wait, was there a question that has gone away maybe? But okay, question. I, I think maybe you already said it, but um, we need to have two of these. Yes. Right? Yes. Right? Yes. Right? Yeah. So there are sort of two reasons. The one that's sort of here is that because the superpotential can only be a function of chiral superfields, or can only be a function of h, it cannot be a function of h dagger. But in the standard model, which is not supersymmetric, if you look at this coupling, it uses h dagger. So now I need to create, I need to just add to the theory another chiral superfield whose quantum numbers are those of h dagger, and yet it's still a chiral superfield. Okay. The second reason is if I just added this, 
then I'd add one more Higgs, I'd add one left-handed Higgsino. I'd add one Higgsino doublet of SU2, which is a vial fermion, it's a chiral fermion, and that would actually introduce a gauge anomaly. So that's something you wouldn't see with the naked eye, you'd have to just think about it. So I'm adding the opposite okay. gauge Geno, Higgsino, and that cancels the gauge anomaly, okay? Um, good, so now we, so this is the supersymmetric limit, and, and hopefully you see it's just, it's just not so bad. And now we have to ask how this field sigma, this is not the summation sign, this is the field sigma that I talked about at the end of the last lecture that spontaneously broke Suzy. We need to figure out, and, 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 and sigma, I gave you the simplest model of supersymmetry breaking. So it has just this one chiral field in it. Nevertheless, to, to say that it belongs to a class of possibilities, which are more complicated, I will give it its official name, that it belongs in a sector which I'll call the hidden sector. Okay. Sigma is to supersymmetry what the Higgs is to the standard model. It breaks, the, it gives mass in some way, it breaks the, so he, this gives, this is going to transmit supersymmetry breaking to the standard model, just like the Higgs gives masses to everybody in the standard model. And of course, the Higgs is a kind of hidden sector. It took up till 2012 to, to define the damn thing, right? So it's pretty well hidden. Similarly, this is worthy of being called its own hidden sector because its VEV is going to do something obvious, just like the Higgs VEV has been obvious for centuries because we have atoms in our body. But the Higgs fluctuation was well hidden. So we call this the hidden sector. The thing that breaks, the sector that breaks supersymmetry spontaneously is the hidden sector. I'm just giving you the language. And we're asking ourselves how it makes its way into the MSSM. Okay, like how does it infect the MSSM? I keep using the word infect because I'm trying, after 20 years, to still win the fight with Lisa about the word quarantine versus sequester. <laughs> um, so I think of Susie breaking as a kind of infection that spreads. Okay. Um, Okay, so, well, you couple the two sectors. And what's the simplest way of coupling them? With some Planck's, some Planck suppressed operators. So here is this, the sort of classic possibility. I will get into more detail about this, but these are just the phi's that we've talked about collectively, all the matter fields of the standard model. So these are all the MSSM fields. And what should I suppress this with? M Planck squared. Okay, and just to allow some order one variation, I'll put a coefficient c here, which I'll just say is order one. Okay, so philosophically, we're all in the same game we've been playing all these days. Um, hold on. Um, okay, so now we can ask, remember, sigma does its thing at pretty high energies, but we can ask, what, what does the MSSM mostly feel? What does the standard model feel like most of the time that you're not running the LHC. It feels like you see the Higgs VEV and you just don't see the Higgs fluctuations, right? Similarly here, we can just ask, what does the MSSM feel like most of the time if you're not doing desperate experiments? It's, it's, it's you replace sigma by its VEV, okay? And since the only things that can get VEVs are scalars, to, uh, consistent with Lorentz invariant, that, that is little sigma plus f of sigma theta squared, okay? Now, in the simple model I gave you, this was zero from last time, and this was lambda squared, that parameter that showed up in the sigma, in the sigma model, okay? Um, so therefore, this goes to, um, now you see, if all that survives in the sigma vev is f, f theta squared, and then f, uh, uh, sorry, lambda squared theta squared, and lambda squared theta bar squared, then this integral d4 theta has to eat up these thetas. So out of this, I can only pull the scalar, which no theta. So therefore, I get c uh, lambda to the fourth over m Planck squared. And, and phi bar phi, where this lower case phi is, is just the scalar fields, the scalars of the standard model, okay? Um, in other words, we're getting a kind of a 
breaking of supersymmetry because the fermions are not getting mass. So this is actually breaking supersymmetry. And from the perspective of the theory after the VEV is put in, it looks like a soft breaking of supersymmetry. It looks like you're breaking it by a dimensionful parameter. It's, it's soft. Okay, if I, if, I, if I resurrect all of sigma dynamics, it's all spontaneous. But if I just plug the VEV in, for most practical purposes, it looks like a soft thing that goes like C lambda uh, squared over M Planck. I'm writing like this to just say the mass of the scalar, not the mass squared. The mass of the scalar is of order lambda squared over M Planck. Okay, let me get to some questions. Yeah. No, because these are the scalars of, so, so the Higgs itself is a scalar. So it might actually have you know, the kind of masses that we write. Well, we're going to go into it, so maybe I should say hold off on the Higgs because we'll talk about it. But there are no other scalars in the standard model, right? Darndest coincidence that scalars are hard to come by. So only the superpartners get mass like this, right? So this is helping to explain that kind of a spectrum, uh, okay? at least as far as the scalars are concerned. And um, okay, and where, whereas you know m psi, until electroweak symmetry breaking, it's zero. In fact, there's chiral symmetries in the standard model that stop you from giving fermion masses until you break um, electroweak symmetry. Um, whereas the, these masses are not electroweak symmetry breaking, right? Scalar mass terms don't have to break any gauge symmetries. Yeah. Um, I would want to say that, but I don't see how you are deducing that yet because I haven't talked about gauge no masses yet. Okay. So here are just the scalars, but it's coming, so hold on. Um, well, yeah. No, I, I, should, I should say it here. So we can just do a quick thing. Like, we haven't talked much about naturalness, but, but you've been around the block a few times. So, so look, this lambda m, the scale, m phi, if it's somewhere within experimental reach, then this thing should be of order TV, right? I don't care if it's 10 TV or 100 GV, just something in human reach. And that implies that the scale lambda, a fundamental SUSY breaking in the hidden sector, uh, has to be about 10 to the 11 GV, pretty high up there. And this is often called the intermediate scale. Okay, just for the obvious reason, it's the geometric mean of the Planck scale and the weak scale. Um, so that's interesting that it's really big, but of course it is much smaller than the Planck scale. And the whole philosophy I've been trying to give you is that my goal is everything, every big hierarchy should be explained by some sort of weird generalization of dimensional transmutation, or at least some sort of exponential stretching out of order one parameters. Whereas in this model, we explicitly put lambda in as a, by hand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's not much of a, we identified this lambda as one point. Nope. Um, oh, it was the, yeah, yeah, lambda to the fourth. Now. I was, doing a the I was doing everything in the limit that G Newton equals zero. There are corrections to that. So don't call lambda to the, f call it the vacuum energy, which you can still say, but, but we can't call it the cosmological constant because you don't know whether when gravity is added, it changes the vacuum energy, and indeed it does. <laughs> so uh, for the moment, I'm not going into the supergravity aspects of it, and so, yeah. Um, I'm pausing because I always forget the, what is it, acronym? I don't even remember the name acronym. Anyway, I forget all of the different models, and I mean, I know what their structure is, but the names, just, anyway. 
They're not my name, so it... <laughs> um, so, uh, so I don't know what you're asking, but ask me afterwards, because I'm not going to go down that path in class. OK. Um, OK, so back, yeah. Yes, because in the, I purposely made the model so that the mass of M sigma is positive. I mean, it's a mass squared is positive, which means it has got a restoring force that wants the VEV to stay stuck at these values. So it is stable in that sense. That'll be important for a little exercise that I'm going to throw your way. Yeah. Could it be metasigma? Uh, so the Higgs, Higgs VEV in the standard model, I think, is. is Stable if you trust, if you only think of the standard model as an effective field theory. But indeed, that also relates to the little exercise that it could be metastable. And, uh, you know, David Shi was, has an infinitely famous paper in which he shows why, how that can dramatically enrich the theories of hidden sectors. Okay. Um, uh, good, which, which really is bringing me up to this thing that I just started talking about, which is can, can lambda come about through dimensional transmutation? Can it actually be that lambda is something vaguely like what the proton mass is, which is e to the minus 1 over some b, some coefficient of order 1, alpha m Planck? OK. Is this possible? And, and indeed, it is. Okay. When that can happen, it's called dynamical supersymmetry breaking. Um, but this is not the standard model. Gauge, like Whatever is the gauge theory that does this is not the standard model. It's part of the hidden sector. Okay. So you'd have to in, enlarge the hidden sector to include uh, some non-standard model gauge theory. with a very large lambda QCD, OK? Not the piddling 1 GV. We're aiming for big, big scales, intermediate scales here, right? So we would need something. So, so this can actually, yes, we can do it. And I'm trying to write the most baby version of such an exercise in the exercises so that you can sort of see how that would work. Having learned the sigma model there, how can I fiddle with it to sort of get this to work. And indeed, it'll turn out to be a case of not where, where, the, where the supersymmetry breaking is only metastable. That is, it might last for 13 billion years, but it doesn't last forever. So, so we'll talk about that in the exercise. But I just want to say that, yes, the highest standards that I have listed at the beginning of the lectures, yeah, can, at even, even down at this level, can be realized like this. And there are many models of dynamical supersymmetry breaking. And there's a review by two of the greats in this game, uh, in Trilligator and Cyberg, that is in the references. Um, and probably includes the work of David Chi, who is the other S in ISS models of Susie breaking. Okay. Um, Good. So, but, but let's keep going just, just with, the, with the toy model of this, because doing that will take us too long, and I want you to do it as an exercise instead. Um, good. So I want to switch to a huge experimental constraint on BSM, OK? And, and uh, so that's all sort of theory, and now we're coming to the fact that we do experiments and we have a lot of data. Okay. And so BSM can be sought after by on-shell searches like the LHC is trying to do, which is you just try and produce the BSM particle on-shell, okay? propagates and decays. Or off-shell searches, you're trying to detect it's propagation off-shell, virtual propagation of it. And of course, if it's virtual propagation and it's not on-shell, then those are usually suppressed, as you know. Um, 
So they have to be off shell. You have to they, you have to pay a price. The price is you have to do precision tests. Okay. And when you do precision tests, you might say, well, I'm sure the experimentalists are being as precise as they can be. But the most precise experiments are where there are no backgrounds, right? If you're looking for a needle in the haystack, it helps if there's no haystack. So we should ask which channels of precision searches, of precision tests. So I'm first, before we, before we worry about this, we should first at least talk about this, OK? And which channels of searches are unusually suppressed in the standard model for structural reasons. They are much smaller than an entering grad student would have guessed by just looking at the couplings. Okay? So in the standard model, the gym mechanism in various senses uh, suppresses unusually flavor changing neutral currents okay something that you should read about you can read about it in george i's book you can read it about it in any textbook on the standard model um, and let's do the dumbest version of it just to remind you this is not really what jim became famous for the g and the i and the m but it's something you know in the standard model that if you look so what are flavor changing neutral currents for the purpose of my quick lightning exposition um, they're where you say doing quark scattering, QI, flavor I, flavor J, flavor K, flavor L. Of course, these are all inside mesons and so on, and so you have to really be a brilliant experimentalist to get this out, but let's not worry about that. And so there are different flavors in this process, but the neutral, the neutral part is that let's say all of these have the same charge, okay? So so in particular, the thing that's getting exchanged will have charge zero. Okay? So here I've drawn the good old Higgs boson being exchanged. And of course, it couples to these guys by Yukawa couplings, right? You know, I, J, K, L. And so you can ask, could this exchange jumble up all the flavors? And you'd say, yeah, look. YIJ, YKL, anything could be anything. These matrices are, after all, not diagonal matrices. But we know that famously in the standard model, which you guys have probably done, that the mass, the mass matrix of these quarks is proportional to these Yukawa couplings. So that when you diagonalize the mass basis, so that in that basis is the basis in which experimentalists name things, top, strange, whatever it is, right? This becomes diagonal, OK? So the, the fact that the mass basis and the coupling basis are the same basis means that when you've diagonalized the masses of these guys to even name them by different flavors, this is automatically diagonal, OK? And then similarly, if you look at the other tree level process, would say the exchange of the z, just by gauge invariance, it's automatically diagonal, OK? So great, that's a kind of flavor changing neutral current where if I just drew some random thing like this with a blob and said, could IJKL be non-trivial? You'd say, yeah, why not, right? Um, now there is a, so you might say that's great at tree level, but what happens if we go to loop level, right? Well, that'll be smaller. So for example, here's a famous diagram where you don't exchange one W because that would be a charged current but two Ws, like a W plus and a W minus, if you want to think of them going this way. And you can do the same thing, right? That I, J, K, L, and the intermediate particle could be R and S. And you'd say, okay, well, then the standard model will have this, and it'll be sort of loop suppressed. And you know that there are CKM angles that are non-diagonal in the standard model, famously. So yeah, you'll get something. And, and it'll be loop suppressed. But maybe if we're very good experimentalists, we can find it. And of course, they are very good experimentalists. But even this is suppressed beyond the 1 over 16 pi squared that you might have thought. It's suppressed because this matrix that keeps showing up is a unitary matrix. It's not a random matrix. It's got one structure. It's unitary. 
And because the V shows up here and the V dagger shows up here, et cetera, et cetera, I'm not going to go through it. This is your standard model exercise to relearn. Um, this is actually much smaller than just loop factor size. Okay, there's a conspiracy of matrix multiplication of V times V daggers that makes this unusually small. Okay, so it's kind of this, that's the G mechanism. It's a striking thing in the standard model that flavor changing neutral currents, the haystack of flavor changing neutral currents is a very tiny haystack. So it's a great place to go looking for um, new physics, okay? Um, now, there's another sort of unusually suppressed channel. Um, there's the standard model, and here, I, I don't want to talk about it, but if, let me just add an axion, a strong CP axion to the standard model. Let's call that the standard model. The Peche, Quinn, Weinberg, Salam standard model or whatever, right? Um, contains only one complex phase in its couplings. And these complex phases are really CP violating couplings, okay? Um, only one complex phase and its effects are masked by all of this gym-like cancellations so that you get very difficult to find, but of course they have famously been discovered, uh, manifestations of CP violation in the standard model. But if anything beyond the standard model introduces CP violation, we would be unusually sensitive to it because these effects are small, okay? The phase itself is order one, but the, the, the magic algebra of the standard model, which you have to learn, the magic algebra of the standard model squashes these effects physically, okay? Just, and, and it's in some, some way like that. Um, great. So, so these are the only two, I mean, we could talk about other things, other precision tests, but these are the two that I wanna hang my hat on. Um, so what happens in sort of the generic SUSY, or in fact, generic BSM of any type, but I'm illustrating everything with SUSY here. What happens generally is that looking for flavor change in neutral currents and CP violation, which we're unusually sensitive to, um, put such severe bounds on where the super partners could be that they are far out of reach of, of any experiment this century, okay? So there, then that's bad news, that, then we're all dead, right? There's nothing to see, okay? So, but, but by what kind of diagrams? Well, they're really like analogs of this box, di so-called box diagram. They look like this, for example. So here is one, I mean, there is a huge subject, but there's a sharp reason, there's a sharp reason for why these bad things happen. So, okay, L. And, and it's this, um, that if we go back to the Susie breaking that I just wrote down over here, uh, this kind of coupling, uh, I was very sloppy here because I didn't write the species or the generation indices here. But, but in fact, so let me write it over here. If I write this lambda to the fourth over m Planck squared, and, and, and but, but now I could have Q, and if I write a generation label, right, I could have, sorry, this is Q tilde, right? These are scalars. Um, okay. These mass terms could actually be matrices in generation space, in which case this coefficient C, this order one coefficient C, is really some, as far as we, in the generic vanilla thing, you just say it's some randomly chosen order one matrix like that, okay? Now, that means that in diagrams like this, where it say this is the Gluino, okay? Nice, healthy, strong interaction there. Um, but this species I, by gauge invariance, it turns into the squark of species I, but because of this, 
And remember, this, this is something, well, well, I'll just write it like this. I'll, I'll, yeah, well, fine, let me just call it this. And then it can turn into species J or K. And then with a nice healthy coupling, get out, okay? So because of this kind of thing, we can now have huge flavor change in neutral currents this way. They are loop level, yes, but they don't have the magic of this piece of algebra, okay, um, to, to save the day. And the, for generic order one, do whatever you want, I don't know any more about this theory, um, the constraints would say that the mass of these, uh, you know, squarks, say, and, and we could do it for other particles as well, would be, say, you know, bigger than like a thousand TeV. Okay, so we're piddling little humans running at 10 TeV, and that's the end of that. Okay, question. Uh, at high energies, if you, if you zoom, on, zoom in on that interaction, uh, is there like a loop there, or is that kinetic mixing? What's going on with this? Um, I'm working in, the, so if I go to, I'm being a bit sloppy in saying it, but if I go to, this is what's called insertion approximation, where I am, let's say I was going to, let's, let's at least look where the loop momentum is very high. It doesn't have to be super, super high, but it's higher than this scale. Then in the propagator, you know, one over p squared minus m squared, you would say this is approximately one over p squared, m squared, one over p squared, okay? And then this is a matrix there. So that's, so this is the one over p squared, here's the matrix, here's the one over p squared. Now, you might say, can't I just work with the whole thing? Yes, you can, but that would take longer to write out. Yeah. But the, the damage is done already, okay. Um, I should say, I should say, I had actually forgotten. Uh, somebody had asked me about the gay geno and then I dropped the ball. <laughs> so back, back over here, the, I don't want to go through it, but a similar coupling of the gauge fields to sigma will give, will, does easily allow gauge, field, gauge geno masses, which again go like lambda squared over m Planck. Okay, so it's the same scale as the scalars. And there's one more fermion, okay. Out of all of these super partners, a lot of them are scalars. They're the gauge genos, that's what I'm saying. There is a way to do that, I just don't have time to do it, and there's not much interesting to say about it. And then there's one other thing, which is a fermion superpartner, and that's the Higgsino. Okay, and it's also a fermion. And, and there is a way of doing this as well. And it even has a name. It's called the Giudice, Giudice Maciero mechanism. And it's easy to read about. I, again, don't want to waste time on that, but it's an important mechanism. Um, so basically, I'm saying that, yeah, all of these fermionic superpartners have a mechanism that is about as dumb in the best sense of the word as this mechanism. But sorry for that digression. I'm back to here, which is what to do, what to do, OK? And this is a problem not about supersymmetry. This is a problem of any BSM scenario, which is sufficiently panoramic. Flavor tests would kill it naively. And similarly, we do exquisitely beautiful tests of CP violation, sometimes as part of flavor tests, sometimes independent of flavor transitions. The classic example are like EDMs, electric dipole moments. And I'm mentioning because they're going on at the moment and they're improving dramatically, and they are on the conscience of, you know, well-intentioned BSM model builders. And, and so, for example, we all know what magnetic, ma magnetic dipole moments look like because we've taken field theory. They come from the electron, say, so here's like the electron EDM. There are other EDMs, neutron EDM. Here's the electron EDM. This, this is the magnetic dipole moment calculation you all know and love from QED. And here, I'm just going to replace it where this internal line is now the selectron, okay? And this line here is now the photino, or really the hypercharge geno, okay? 
Um, but you might say that just gives some other contribution to the magnetic moment of the electron or the muon, and actually could give an interesting observable, read my last or second last paper. Um, it's in the references. But anyway, it could give contributions to g minus 2 of the muon. But, um, but if, if there, so if there are new, if there are new, meaning when you go beyond the standard model, if there are new CP violating phases, for example, the mass parameter of this gauge eno might be complex and have a phase. Um, then EDMs, electric dipole moments and magnetic dipole moments are complex partners, if you like. Um, the same calculation sort of is the, sa is this the same, but if there are phases in there, then it turns what would have been a BSM contribution to the magnetic moment into a contribution to the electric moment, electric dipole moment. And, um, and once again, the bounds are super tight. And Matt Reese is coming next week, I think. And he's an expert on this. And I've given some references. Uh, I think this is reference 15 on Matt Reese et al.'s review of electric dipole moments and its impact on new physics. Uh, for all this flavor violating stuff, um, I guess that's here, beyond the standard model flavor violation and constraints, I've given another reference like that. And uh, good. So question. Um, do the uh, EDM bounds also tell us that the CZ masses are going to be very high? Yes, yes, yes. I just forget the exact numbers, but yeah, it could be 100 TeV or something like that, that just like that, 1,000 TeV or thousands of TeV. It's just not good news if all you have is SUSY and no other plan, then you should just assume you're not going to live long enough to see it, OK? So what is the plan? Like, and you know, if the plan smells too much of like too much struggle, then it's quite possible nature is not playing that. So it has to be an elegant plan. After all, this mechanism is pure genius. It's a, it is a standard model. But it is pure genius how the conspiracy was. Nobody was actually Jim when they introduced the charm quark as a con concept and so on. They were model building a mechanism to try and deal with flavor changing neutral currents and stuff like that. And it turned out to be right. Okay, but now having built the standard model, when you look back, you'd say, oh, structurally, the standard model just automatically has these conspiracies built in. They were not optional in some way. Okay. At the time, it looked like an option, and so it had to be a model builder that puts them in place. What is the key feature? Before I give you a solution in our current context, I want to give a standard, which is a very high standard. Maybe you could weaken it and still survive, but it's a simple standard, so it's worth saying. What makes the standard, in other words, what makes the standard model so good at hiding flavor changing neutral currents and CP violation? So the key to the standard model uh, plus axion, OK, fine. Um, suppression of flavor changing neutral currents and CP violation is that the Yukawa couplings, y up, y down, y lepton, ij, these are matrices, of course, are the only source in the theory of um, flavor, flavor changing of any sort or CP violation of any sort, OK? That, so for example, you might say, why is that the key? Well, I'm going to say it only at tree level, that I'll t you know, relearn the standard model and you'll see. But I'll just go back to here. Here's, here's a story where the flavor violating couplings of the Higgs to fermions is given by a Yukawa matrix. but the flavor violating mass matrix is also given by the same matrix. So there's only one matrix to diagonalize, and then you're safe. Okay, So that's the dumbest, dumbest version of it. 
but it turns out that is the key, okay, I'm asserting, that, that these are the, oh, that the Yukawa couplings are the only source of flavor violation and CP violation is the key to the way the standard model hides its flavor violating CP violating tracks. Okay. So what does it suggest? It suggests, okay, it doesn't, it's not a hard and fast theorem, but it suggests um, that BSM structure should at least approximately respect this. Meaning, I'm adding new particles, I'm adding new interactions, all sorts of things, but the only things that should break, that should violate flavor and CP are just the same standard model uh, Yukawa matrices. Uh, not obvious that that's possible because you're adding a lot of new particles and a lot of new parameters. Some of them could have complex phases, et cetera. But, but that's the rule, okay? Um, and you might say, where did we go wrong? Like, what did we do wrong? Why did we violate? I mean, there it is. There's the, there's the MSSM. It's only got these Yukawa matrices. It's beautiful. It's doing all the right things. But no, the, the broken MSSM, okay, the broken MSSM, the, the softly broken MSSM, comes with a whole bunch of new matrices in flavor space, and it violates my rule, okay? So we want a, we want a more special structure where this doesn't happen. Okay, so question. Uh, what's the problem with violating these things on a very high scale? Um, yeah, Here's, I think this is a good example. From the perspective of the MSSM, this is a mass term for scalars. When this thing is imprinted, even at very high scales, these are not non-renormalizable op operators which become weak in the infrared. They are mass terms, and up to some logs, they just stick around. So the damage done in the UV in some way just basically sticks around. Now, that's true at weak coupling. And at strong coupling, there are some special tricks. But the spe special tricks are ADS-CFT dual to what I'm about to show you, okay? where strong dynamics turns into an extra dimension. Hence, we're coming to the extra dimension part. Um, there are many tricks. Often, they're related by dualities of various subtle ways. But let me, OK. Um, good. So a board that I don't have to clean. OK, fine. Is in the standard model, is it? Um, the, the, yes, as long as all the fermions are light compared to the weak scale. Obviously, the top quark is an exception, and that means that the top quark deserves special attention, which I don't have time to give. But what saves it is the top quark doesn't mix very much with the other fermions. The third generation doesn't mix as much as the first two generations. So that saves it. But yes, so. But it's easy to see that if all the fermions were light, then this would be exactly right. Then uh, your answer, the answer to your question would be yes. Yeah. OK, um, good. So we are going to combine the two types of extra dimensions that we've talked about, the bosonic kind and the fermionic kind. OK, that's it. Um, so the setup looks like this. where we are going to say that the chiral superfields are a bit like those scalars when I did extra dimensions, where if the, that, they, that, that there's a possibility of being glued to one wall or the other, right, when we took the mass to be big compared to L. Um, so I'm not going to describe that mechanism again. I'm just going to say, let's just say that the hidden sector is literally hidden because it's living on this wall, while the standard model chiral superfields are living on this wall. And they are sufficiently well localized that they essentially are not talking to each other, except if they send a messenger into the bulk, OK? Which I will have to account for. Yeah. Uh, why should there be only two sheets? 
Not necessary. I'm doing the simplest thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can draw it. That's, um, for example, I'm about to use an extra dimension for a purpose to do with the flavor problem. I showed you another extra dimension to do with the origin of flavor hierarchies. They could be two different extra dimensions, right? So I'm just doing one thing at a time. Um, OK, so these guys do not directly talk to each other by locality. They can't, OK? They, this one moves around on this place, and this one moves around on this place. Um, but the gauge fields, which I told you are called V, are, are, are in the bulk. Okay? Um, and they can act and so they can communicate in some way back and forth. Um, so this is the toy model that I first want to show you. And then I'll just quickly say what turns it into a realistic model. Um, good. So this is thing number one. And the fact that these two, that, so, so one is, what, why is this important? In, in immediately solving this problem? Like, why does this one move of just keeping these two things apart immediately solve this problem? Okay? It does because Susie breaking is localized here. Okay, that's what the hidden sector is doing. And the visible sector is here, but all the flavors live here. So that means that all flavor violation is, is living here. OK? Uh, the flavor violation is not coupled to the supersymmetry breaking, right? In this problem, the flavor violation, like this is a parameter that is both flavor violating and SUSY violating, right? But that, can't, but that can't happen here, OK? Now, it does look like you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Because if I can't couple phi to sigma, like I did over there, it's certainly true that I solve the flavor problem. But I solve it by basically having c equals 0. That's a very flavor that I'm not introducing any new flavor violation. right? Why is it 0? Because I cannot couple phi to sigma in the way I said. Okay. So fine, we have to worry about that. We will. We'll, that, that's not a problem, but apparently it's a problem. But I've certainly solved, you can't say I didn't solve getting rid of these CIJs. I've, I've, I've set them to zero by this geographical enforcement. Okay? And, and it's even possible to make the CP violation be localized here, whereas CP is actually conserved here. So flavor violates, flavor and CP are violated here. SUSY and flavor, since there are no flavors here, then it's, of course, flavor symmetric, trivially. So flavor CP broken here, SUSY broken here. Okay? That separation is going to be key. And, um, and again, let's call this distance L. Okay? Um, so the first thing is, again, my own sort of model building prejudice would be that 1 over L, the compactification scale, the scale at which this extra dimension would become obvious to an experimentalist, should be bigger than any kind of grand unified scale, you know, of whatever high scale it is. In other words, way up there. So it's not an extra dimension that's going to open up to a collider imminently. And why do I want this to be true? So that the 4D renormalization group equations hold uh, uh, b below m gut could be equal. Okay. Uh, because remember, when we're looking at the evidence for grand unification by, look, by running the, the, the gauge couplings and watching them combine, and in the SUSY theory, they, of course, famously combine rather well. It's quite dramatic circumstantial evidence in favor of SUSY unification. That's all because of the four-dimensional renormalization group. That four-dimensional renormalization group has to hold all the way to the gut scale. Otherwise, that doesn't happen. So in order to have 4D dynamics all the way to the gut scale, I need 5D dynamics to only come in at or after the gut scale. Okay? So the simplest thing is to think that 
this is really a tiny extra dimension, but might still influence what we see on the ground. Yeah. Um, why wouldn't you want the four, uh, the five D dynamics to come in before the gut scale so that the unification happens in that nice way? Oh, because it doesn't. Because the running then becomes a kind of five D analog of running, which is okay. not got the subtlety of the four D log running, and so it takes away the sort of shock value that you put in the experimental numbers and you just do the standard running. That people have played with it, but it does not work as well. That's, so that's, again, you can, uh, maybe you throw that out if you had some super other exciting idea to pursue, but I'm pursuing Susie as the main thing. Not extra dimensions is what shows up in a collider, not today, but Susie is what might show up in a collider. So I'm happy to play safe, okay? So that's, that's one. Um, but the fact that the gauge fields, and including the gauge eno, can come here, can talk to this guy, sigma, the hidden sector, means that we can generate a gauge eno that, that just goes along with what I said before, OK? So it seems like by this separation, sequestering, um, the gauge enos are great. They're fine. But the Higgsinos and the scalars have zero mass, OK? And that, while it solves the supersymmetric flavor problem and CP problem, because those are the only couplings, you know, all the couplings here are supersymmetric. So it's just the thing on the board here. And the only things you're seeing that violate flavor are Yukawa couplings. So that's great, OK? Um, good. So let me just give a couple of references. This is. Uh, so this separation of flavor from SUSY breaking is, sadly, what's called sequestering. And it was first introduced by Lisa Randall and me in a, in a different scenario, which is not what I'm talking about today. But I did think it was worth your reading at least, the, as I say, in if you look up reference 16, I thought it was worth reading the first few sections, because it's the first place that sequestering was introduced just to see what was the mindset of how we were do doing, I think, the wrestling with the flavor problem and all of that and saying what could be going on. And we're led to posit this, OK? Um, but the specific setup that I'm showing you here is actually called Gageno, for reasons you're going to see in one second why it's named this, Gageno mediated. Uh, Suzy breaking, um, and that's sometimes abbreviated as Gageino G tilde MSB. Okay, and and the, the the original references are there in. Oh gosh, I'm turn that off. The original references are there in um, reference 17, but I also include my recent paper, which applies this to things that are still of great interest to the LHC right now for the high luminosity run and to dark matter detection right now in WIMP searches. Um, so, and it's, and it's also easier to read than maybe the original ones because it summarizes everything quickly. So take a look at those. Okay, that's, that's this setup. Um, good, so we're sitting on one problem. We have solved the supersymmetric uh, flavor problem, but all the squarks and sleptons are massless. So, OK, so we got to solve that problem. Um, before I do, there was one, how did I manage to skip that? So the, one, of the, one of the physical impacts of our parity is that since the, 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 is that the lightest, the lightest superpartner, let's call it the LSP, the lightest superpartner, it has parity, which is odd. It can't decay into even things and preserve parity. So this, this thing is stable. And as long as the universe was ever hotter than its mass, it must be, it must be part, at least part or all, of dark matter. OK, because it's stable. So it's, it's around us. Um, so that's exciting. And of course, it is basically, this, this, it's, it's, it, this, this is WIMP 
this is weakly interacting massive particle dark matter. Okay, this is that's that's where this name came from, and hopefully you've been exposed to some of its interest and current interest too. Um, so I should have said that. That's one of the attendance advantages of imposing our parity. Um, it's not the only way that supersymmetry could contain dark matter, but it's the classic way that people often talk about. Okay, so back to the problem. When I said that this is solving by taking C equals zero, effectively forcing C to be zero, that we have solved the supersymmetric flavor problem. That's true, we have solved that problem. We don't have scalar masses, but we only don't have them at tree level, okay? We, um, I need a board, okay. We only don't have them at tree level. So radiative corrections can solve this problem And they do, so loop. Um, so in the 4D effective theory, we see it. In, at the 5D level, they, they just do not couple to each other. There is no direct coupling. There's nothing you can write in a Lagrangian, a local Lagrangian, no matter how many loops you do. At 5D level, the effective Lagrangian does not give a direct coupling that does not give mass to these guys. But in the 4D effective field theory, we can do loops, doesn't know anything about the extra dimension, and things will look like this. Where a scalar and a fermion and the gaugino can appear like this. This is the classic diagram. There are other diagrams, but this is the classic one. And, and so, it, because this thing has got a you know, this thing has a Susie breaking mass, and Susie breaking, breaking of a symmetry is infectious. Keeps going down to whoever talks to it. Um, you're not surprised that this is some alpha over four pi, some loop factor, m lambda squared, times some log. Oh, by the way, there would be other, there's the obvious diagram. Here's the obvious diagram, okay? The, the sort of partner of this. And there are cancellations, so there's nothing quadratically diverging. There are, in fact, logs here. Normally, this would be like log divergent. It's not even divergent. It's not log divergent. Normally, you would have thought of getting something like log of some cutoff over m lambda or something. But the role of the cutoff in this higher dimensional theory is played by the compactification scale, OK? which is finite, okay? So amazingly, this calculation doesn't have something that you go and normalize. Or you actually have a prediction, right? This is finite and calculable. Um, so you really are getting, once you have this, once you know what m lambda is, then this thing is determined by it without introducing any new flavor violating parameters. Um, this would be 4D. If it was pure 4D, then there'd be a log divergence. But in 5D, that gets cut off. If you want, the diagram you're doing from the 5D, I've said it in 4D effective field theory. From the 5D perspective, you would say that this diagram looks like this. The scalar splits into its Fermi, fermion partner emits a gaugino that travels across the universe and back and carries the information of Suzy breaking down to here. The fact that it has to travel a finite distance makes this diagram relative to a 4D diagram, it makes it ultraviolet finite. Though this, this distance is ultraviolet regulating, it's physical, so it's not a regulator, but effectively it's regulating what would have been a logarithmic divergence and turning it into a beautiful finite calculation. It's, a, it's almost like a baby way in which string theory gives you finite answers. Okay, yeah. Yeah, presumably with this model, like uh, assuming that we are in 4D and now we are in 5D and we are still, sort of still using this, like, uh, I guess, 4D multivariate sentence. Um, 
Yeah. So the so the the of course these the the matter living on the boundaries really are just 4D. So that's okay. The one thing you could complain about, you say, look, you moved your gauge theory into 5D, and you didn't describe how to describe it. And I might give you a reference which uses 4D superspace to talk about even 5D with a trick, OK? But so that you'd need that to explicitly do it. So all I can do here is, is to say it quickly, OK? So the only place that, once you say that this is even, like the setup can be made, and we're studying below the compactification scale, then it turns into effective 4D calculations, which you can do, which you are set up to do. Yeah, question. Um, this might be a super naive question, but is there still like a speed limit in the fifth dimension? Like, is there, is there, still, a, is there like, a, a speed of light? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's 5D Poincaré invariance. Oh, okay. Great. Speed of light. Yeah. Um, one. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, great. So, so, so now you see that by this kind of means, all the realism comes back while still being consistent. With solving the um, with solving the uh, flavor and CP problems, and I should just say the realistic version of this is not very much different. You can read about it in the references. The realistic version is where you remember all of the all of the phi's I put here, but the realistic version is just to take only the Higgses and move them into bulk fields. Okay. And I don't want to go into it, but that allows them to also get supersymmetry breaking masses like the Higgs Eno mass can be gotten in that way. Um, but I, I don't want to go into that level of realism because I wanted to uh, say a word about electroweak symmetry breaking and naturalness, whole topic of the t course, um, uh, in, a, in a quick sketch. Yeah. How have, sorry, could you say that again? What is the scale of? It's not 1,000 TeV anymore, right? Like one yes, so now, without, so this is a beautiful theory that could have shown up below TeV, right? From a purely flavor, from precision test point of view, this is something that could have shown up at the TeV scale. It might show up at the LHC. Elements of it might still be allowed to show up. It could show up at future colliders. In other words, I'm giving you, so already I'm pausing to say, this is the beautiful thing I was talking, just as an example of what a beautiful theory would look like. You can see all the different field theory elements that have gone into it, and it solves these problems, right? Um, are you indicating something? <laughs> um, so let me see, what, what, should I, what should I stress? I think I wanted to take five minutes to talk about electroweak symmetry breaking, and then I'm willing to skip my last two crucial things. Um, there's nobody after me. <laughs> Are we running out of videotape? Well, I will, I will keep selling you. I will, I'll keep telling you what you can buy. But, but right now, I just wanted to talk about electroweak symmetry breaking because it's so damn exciting. Um, so I don't think I need this anymore. And this is, this is quick, at the level that I'm about to do it. This is quick. So back to the Higgs in this toy model, in this toy model, which is not that different from the real model. Um, if we look at uh, things like what I just talked about, even with the Higgs, say this is the W and the Higgsino and the Higgs and, and stuff like that, that's just a special case of what I talked about over there. So the M Higgs uh, squared goes like some alpha electroweak over 4 pi times M Wino, say. This is already the, we, the, the Wino uh, squared uh, times some log. And I'm not going to, I'll just write log for the moment. And, um, but if, if it's the uptype Higgs, then there's another very important coupling which is the top quark, because the Yukawa coupling of the top is pretty big. And, uh, and then there's sort of supersymmetric partners of that, like y top squared, and this is the stop. Okay. 
and they sort of, again, approximately cancel, but they give a net contribution which now goes like y top squared. Again, all order one factors have been ruthlessly suppressed times some log, okay? Uh, because the gut scale is pretty high, these logs are pretty big, okay? So truly, and if you read even the even my last second last paper or last paper, we'll just quote you the standard renormalization group equation. These kind of large log things should really be RG resummed. I don't have time for that, so I'm just writing it like this. Okay, but just naively you'd get that, and this itself, this itself is just really alpha QCD just by that formula over there over four pi times m gluino squared times itself another log, okay? So this is the Higgs mass squared parameter of the whole doublet. If it is positive, which all the gauge interactions want it to be, there will be no electroweak symmetry breaking because we need a tachyonic sign for the Higgs mass to get electroweak symmetry breaking. But because the top is heavy, amazingly, it is actually heavy, because the top is heavy, this is a non-trivial contribution and can actually switch things to be negative, right? So that if I just cut to the chase and draw where in parameter space things are successful in terms of fitting electroweak symmetry breaking, um, so let's say the fundamental parameters, the ones that we see at tree level for the SUSY breaking are things like M Gluino and M we know. Okay, and let's say this is the weak scale, and this is the weak scale, okay? Then basically, I mean, I'm gonna say it very crudely, because the loop factors sort of are canceling with the large logs to some rough, roughly, okay? Um, it's, it's, it's like M we know squared minus M blue we know squared is M Higgs squared or something, right? So, so there's sort of a picture that looks like this that, uh, that this is the region in which m Higgs squared is roughly minus, you know, the weak scale squared, okay? In other words, where these two numbers, if, if, if the Wino mass is big and the Gluino mass is big, then there has to be a relatively tight cancellation to get something of order the weak scale squared. That's what this, that's what, sorry, that's what this funnel is meant to indicate. But of course, if both the Wino and the Gluino are sort of around the weak scale, it looks like this. So this is the parameter space of the theory where roughly you would say, oh, I, I, this is where something like the standard model with weak scale showing up shows up. In this region, there's no electroweak symmetry breaking. In this region, electroweak symmetry breaking is much above the 100 GeV scale that we observe. This is sort of, you know, so now, now I, had many conversations at lunch, but basically the hierarchy problem, which I haven't talked about in great detail, I want you to just take it in at this glance, which is to say, I'm now going to stand like this and throw the chalk, and wherever it hits, I would say, well, that's a typical place I should have lived. That's where I, the universe should have been. And, and, and in a sense, if these guys, if you tell me that these guys are sort of by definition, you know, in some units, they were sort of both around there, then I would say this is a very natural place to be.